Good morning. We are encouraged by the presence of each one of you today. If you are visiting with us, we are especially excited to have you with us, and we want you to know that we consider you to be our honored guest here today and invite you to come back and worship with us here at Pyburn Street any time that you may have the opportunity to do so. It seems that Christians today know less and care less about the Word of God than they did in past generations. And as a result of this, there is an alarming number of unchurched people in the world today and religious dropouts in the world around us today. Likewise, there are many who claim to be religious, but yet they believe that any church that you want to be a part of is perfectly acceptable. They believe that any doctrine that you want to follow is perfectly acceptable so long as you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You see those who jump from faith to faith with rapid speed without ever establishing any type of foundation whatsoever. You see those and even see many who are raised in the Lord's church that will marry and will follow their spouse into whatever religious belief that they were a part of, not having ever established that strong foundation. But even more sadly, we find churches today that are allowing their preachers to swap pulpits or even belong to ministerial alliances, things of that nature, with those whom they disagree, all in the guise of trying to promote fellowship and unity. But folks, we find that as a result of this, great tides of division have caused seemingly irreparable damage to the cause of Christ. In just the last 120 years in the United States, there have been at least 13 major divisions within the body of Christ. And folks, what's happening is we are facing an epidemic in this country of people who do not know what they believe, do not know what they should believe, and do not know why they should believe it. Those of you who are oh, we'll say 50 years of age and older, you remember a time when the pulpit and the Bible class was filled with doctrine, was filled with lessons on basic Bible principles and indoctrination, the things that we need to know in order to be faithful to God and to maintain that foundation. But it seems today that the pulpit has become more of a place for self-help lessons and feel-good speeches and entertaining stories rather than the doctrine of Jesus Christ. But over time, we were led to believe that people no longer wanted to hear that kind of lesson. People already knew what to believe and, need, and, and knew why they believed it. Therefore, why do we need to talk about those things anymore? And what has happened is we have at least two generations of people in the Lord's church today that have never heard lessons preached on some of the most fundamental teachings that we find in the pages of God's Word. All because... They thought that it was something that was already understood. Something that we didn't need to talk about. Or on the other hand, maybe you had those who did not want to hear those things. They weren't willing to bear those things. They had itching ears and they wanted to hear something different. And so they sought out those that would promote those things. But the question that we have to ask ourselves as we enter into this lesson this morning is this. Can we disregard the teaching of doctrine and expect people to come to a conviction of faith. I don't believe we can. Yes, today we do focus on many worthwhile subjects. We talk a lot about love. We talk a lot about fellowship. 
We talk a lot about the relationships that exist in the body. We talk a lot about morality. We talk about Christian service. But if we neglect the subjects of doctrine and those basic principles that each and every person must understand in order to live a faithful Christian life, then we're going to be misdirected. We're not going to be guided in the way that we should go And we're not going to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God as we should. But what it all begins with is we must be motivated. We have to want to know about these things. Motivation is the key to everything that we do in this Christian life. If we are not motivated to live the Christian life, if we are not motivated to serve God, if we are not motivated by the desire to go to heaven, we're not going to live the Christian life. We're not going to study His Word. We're not going to apply those things to our life. Like we talked about in class this morning, we're just going to do the bare minimum. We're going to make sure life is easy because, folks, it is easy to be lost. To be lost, simply do nothing. That's the easy way. That's why Jesus said that the way that leads to destruction, that it's a broad way. It's an easy path. But folks, if we don't want to go down that way, that path of least resistance, we have to be motivated. But what is it that motivates us? What is it that produces that catalyst in our life that leads us to finally make that decision that we want to follow Jesus? Well, whenever we think only along the lines of those things that are positive, those things that are edifying, those things that are uplifting. Folks, those things may stir the emotions. They may make us happy. They may make us feel good. But our minds are not going to be changed. Our minds are not going to be convicted by those things. We're not going to be led into a proper understanding of the will of God. For example, we turn to Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, we're introduced to a man by the name of Demetrius. Demetrius was a silversmith. And there in the city of Ephesus, one of their main trades was to craft graven images of the goddess Diana out of silver. And so when the Apostle Paul came into the city of Ephesus, and he began to preach to them that they no longer needed to be worshiping this idol, but that they needed to be worshiping the one true God of heaven, Well, Demetrius, he went out to all of his other silversmiths and he convinced them that if people start listening to Paul, it's going to hurt the pocketbook. And so they went out. They were motivated by that. Their emotions were stirred up. They were angered. They were afraid for their way of life. They went out and they stirred up the emotions of everybody else. It says that a mob came together and for two hours straight, think about this, For two hours straight, this mob stood around chanting, Great is Diana of the Ephesians, over and over and over. But folks, verse 19 tells us that most of the people that were there did not even know why. They didn't even know why they were there. They knew there was a mob there. They knew that their emotions had been stirred up, but they had no idea what was going on. They had no idea why they were chanting and what what had brought this about. They had no clue. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we find another interesting account. Elijah, he stands back and he's watching the prophets of Baal. And these prophets of Baal, for hours straight, they cut themselves They danced around. They essentially made fools of themselves crying out to Baal to send down fire and consume this altar. And I always kind of get a little chuckle out of it when I think about it. And here is Elijah. He's standing back there and he's taunting these people. Where's Baal at? Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he can't hear you. Maybe you need to yell a little louder. Well, folks, their emotions got stirred up. They were excited by what was taking place. These men had a lot of enthusiasm. 
Folks, they spent all day long doing this. All day long trying to get Baal to do what, what Elijah had asked that they get Baal to do. All day long. Folks, that takes enthusiasm. That takes motivation. But this enthusiasm was misdirected. It was not based upon a desire to do what is right. It was not based upon a desire to serve God and be pleasing to Him. But we see the same kinds of things today. Oftentimes, people will choose the place that they worship based upon not what is right, but based upon the social scene. Or they will focus upon the place where their friends and family are. Or maybe they're a, a person that's in the business world and they have a lot of clientele that's a part of that congregation. And they think if they go and they be a part of that group that it's going to help their business. Or they see a congregation and they say, well, this is where the upper crust of society goes and that's what I want to be a part of. Or they say, well, this is the exciting place. This is where everything is, is upbeat and they get your emotions going and they get you all fired up. Or I want to go to this place because this is where all the kids are. Or I want to go to this place because this is where all the college age people are. I want to go to this place because their services are short and I can get out in time to beat everybody to the restaurant. You know, these are the kinds of things that people use in determining where they're going to worship at today. Folks, they know just enough to know they need to go to church, but not enough to determine what God really wants. Not enough to determine where God really wants them to be. So once again, there's no conviction there. There's no grounding in the truth that is helping them determine what is the proper place. But folks, the church has always faced problems. Always faced struggles of conviction. And God expects His people, He expects you and I, to know how to handle those situations. When problems of doctrine arise, when problems of opinion arise, when problems of morality or whatever the case may be, when those things arise, the question is, do we know how to handle those things? Do we know how to rightly divide the Word of God to understand what's right and what's wrong? Folks, in America today, we are fighting so many unfruitful works of darkness. And it seems like it's getting darker and darker every day. Do we know how to answer that? Do we know how to shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ into this world? Do we even know really where we stand on those things? Or do we say, well, those are just societal whims. Those are societal issues or political issues that are just going to rise or fall on, them, uh, on their own selves and it's not something we need to worry about as Christians. But the question that we have to ask, are we going to stand with God or are we going to stand with the world? And folks, if we're going to stand with God, we have to know what we're standing on. We have to know what that foundation is. And we have to know why we're standing on it. Why do we believe what we believe? Why do we practice what we practice? Why do we worship the way that we worship? But ultimately, what we need to be careful of is making sure that we do not move from a position of striving to glorify God to a position of striving to glorify man. This morning I am convinced that we could have this building bursting at the seams within a month's time if we lay doctrine aside. Think about it. If we tell people what they want to hear, we tickle their itching ears, folks, we would be having to build a bigger building. But we can't do that. We cannot take that step. And the reason that is is because you and I and every person in the world around us, we have only one life to live. And when this life is over, 
we will be judged based upon the way that we have lived this life, whether it's been in keeping with God's will or whether it's been contrary to God's will. We only have one chance to get it right. And that's why it is so important that we understand what God's Word teaches and that we practice those things that are contained therein. Therefore, we need to know the truth. We need to be convicted of the truth. But above that, we need to know why. Why are we convicted of the truth? Brethren, this morning, we're beginning what I'm going to call an irregular series of lessons on first principles. Or we could refer to those as basic Bible doctrines. And I say that it's going to be an irregular series because we may not cover these each and every Sunday morning for the next few months, but these are ones that on a regular basis we're going to be covering some of these issues, some of these topics that must be a part of our understanding and must be a part of our practices in order to be faithful to the Lord. The main basis for this study is going to be from 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. For in this verse, Peter says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Folks, basically what the apostle is saying here is know what you believe and know why you believe it. And be able to tell people why. Can you tell others why you believe what you believe? Can you tell people even what you believe? If not, then hopefully through this series of lessons, we'll be able to come to a better understanding of these things and be better equipped to answer those questions that may come along. In the example of the church in the first century, we find that this concept of belief made a major difference in the atmosphere of congregations. We have the example of the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. Yes, they had a deep love and they had a deep affection for Paul and for the other apostles. But notice that what is said about them is they are commended not for just taking the word at face value. Yes, they believed and they trusted Paul. They trusted these other apostles. But when they heard something being proclaimed, what did they do? They made sure they went out and they searched the scriptures daily to make sure they weren't being led astray to make sure that these men really were teaching the truth. And they were told that they were noble. They were commended and admired for the things that they were doing. They were motivated by their desire to be right. They knew that the scriptures would not lead them astray. And that's what they used as their guide. And when they made sure that the scriptures meshed with what they were being taught, folks, they accepted it. They were convicted by it, and they didn't question it. That's the way we must be today. You know, so many times we talk about this concept of being set in our ways, and so many times we talk about that from a negative point of view. We talk about people that, that we say they're getting old and set in their ways. Well, folks, as children of God, we better be set in our ways. As children of God, once we are convicted of what the scriptures teach, we need to be set in that. In fact, the scriptures tell us that we are to be set for the defense of the gospel. Once we know the truth, do not waver from it. Don't turn away from the truth. The apostles had this conviction. Yes, they had things going for them that we don't have today, the apostles actually traveled with Jesus. They witnessed many of his miracles. They learned at his feet. They had the gift of inspiration. They had these signs that they were able to use to confirm the message. But they had such conviction that they were willing to lay down their lives if that's what it took. They were so sold on Jesus Christ that they would not waver from it. So much so that you may remember that at one point they were actually brought in, they were arrested, and they were told, you better quit preaching. You better quit talking about this guy, Jesus. In Acts chapter 5, it has these words. 
They responded back to this Sanhedrin council. They said, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Well, do you remember what happened? These men were taken, they were beaten, and they were turned loose. Well, what did they do? They immediately went out again and started preaching Jesus. Well, they were arrested again. They were brought back in before the council and putting it in modern day terminology, the council said, are you men dumb? Do you not understand what it is that we have told you? We told you don't be preaching about Jesus. We beat you within an inch of your life and yet you went back out and you did it again. And showing this great love and this great conviction Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, their response, we ought to obey God rather than man. What conviction, what deep faith these men must have had. But yet in the religious world around us today, we're told that doctrine is not something that's set. That doctrine is something that is all relative. Basically, you establish your own doctrine. You establish your own beliefs. You live however you want to live. You follow God's will the way you want to follow God's will. That nobody's going to tell you what to do and how to do it. That you do it your own way. Well, folks, the New Testament is filled with warnings about this type of attitude. Paul warned the elders in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30. He says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So we see in the first century they already understood the importance of belief. That it's important what we believe. But also, Paul, when he was writing to Titus concerning the qualifications of elders, you may remember in Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, he says that these men must be holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine. Folks, that's a key there, sound doctrine. That indicates that there's such a thing as unsound doctrine. By sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So Paul tells Titus very plainly, it's important what these men believe. And the reason that it's important what they believe is because they're the ones that's going to be guiding the beliefs of others. They're going to be making sure that those that they are shepherding over are believing the right things. So they have to believe sound doctrine, not those things that are contrary to it. Again, to the Ephesians, in Ephesians 4 and verse 14, Paul wrote that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. He says, don't be led astray by every wind of doctrine that comes along, every new and exciting thing that enters your mind. Don't think, well, that might be okay, let's try that out. Once you've learned the truth, once you understand the doctrine of Christ, don't deviate from it. Stick with it. Be set in your ways. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, verses 3 through 5, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of a faith unfeigned. So folks, we see that there are several different spiritual conditions that one might find themselves in. First off, we find that there may be those who are uninformed and simply acting out of ignorance. These are the ones that have not been taught or the ones that have been led astray. You take, for example, the Jews. The Apostle Paul, he said that they had a zeal, but their zeal was not based upon knowledge, Romans 10 and verse 2. Before his conversion, you may remember that Saul of Tarsus, what he was doing, he said that it was an all good conscience. He thought that he was right with God. He thought that God was pleased with him persecuting the church. 
But you remember he told Timothy in 1 Peter, I'm sorry, in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 13, he said that he had acted out of ignorant disbelief. He was ignorant of the truth. He had not been taught the truth on these matters. And so he was acting out of ignorance. But once he learned the truth, he laid all that aside. Once he realized that what he was doing was wrong, that the doctrines that he was following were not, in, were not pleasing to God, then he immediately changed his way of life. He immediately sought out the truth and wanted to do what was right. That's the attitude that we must all have. That if we realize or come to the realization that there's something in our life that we have been ignorant of, even if it's something that we've been practicing for, for decades, if it's something that's contrary to the will of God, we have to be willing to lay that aside in order to follow after sound doctrine. If not, we're not going to be pleasing to God. On the other hand, there are those who have a great knowledge of God's word, but they have no zeal to follow it. Some of the most outspoken atheists in the world today know more about the Bible than many preachers do. There are many of them that could quote scripture after scripture after scripture, but they have no faith in the scriptures. There's no zeal to follow the things that are contained therein. They have a tremendous amount of knowledge, but they're not acting upon it. They're ever learning, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 7, they're ever learning, but they never come to a knowledge of the truth. But then we have those that have a faith that is based upon their knowledge of the Word of God. Jude, in verse 3, he says to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And the question that we have to answer is this, if we are not convicted of the truth, how can we do that? If we are not indoctrinated with the teachings of God's Word, how can we contend earnestly for the faith? We can't do it. We can't do it. In Galatians 1 and verse 23, the Apostle Paul said that he was proclaiming the faith that he had once tried to destroy. But then by the time he came to the end of his life, there in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7, he said that he knew that he had fought a good fight and that he had kept the faith. He had lived that faithful Christian life and therefore he knew that there was a crown of righteousness that was laid up waiting for him. But not just for him, but for all those who love his appearing. But we must remember, as John said in 1 John 4 and verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There's so much false doctrine, so many false teachings, but in God's word, there are things that must be believed, there are commands that must be obeyed, and there are promises to be received. But without an understanding of those things, we'll never come to an appreciation of God's word. We'll never come to a point of having the kind of foundation of faith that we need to have because when we neglect these we're neglecting our Christian duty folks we are constantly bombarded with tests of faith Satan is constantly putting temptation in front of us to lay this aside and go back out into the world he is constantly trying to entice us with the pleasures of this life but yet we follow the example of Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness by Satan and the three examples of temptations that he faced in each and every one of those he turned to the Word of God he used his knowledge of Scripture and that gave him the strength and the motivation that he needed to overcome those temptations this is what we must do as well but with all this in mind we cannot forget that teaching ourselves and teaching others these things that we must believe is something that is essential. The scriptures tell us that there are many things that are a truth. 
things that must be accepted. Folks, they're not relative. They are absolute truths. And we must be willing to accept those things. We must be willing to teach those things to others. But also, sometimes we need to be reminded of those things. Most of the things that we're going to talk about in these future lessons, they're not going to be new concepts. They're going to be things that we've heard about, that we've read about throughout our life. But folks, our rate of forgiveness, I'm sorry, our rate of forgetfulness is very high. And the older we get, the more we forget. And so we need to be reminded of these things. And these are things that as we go through this life, we need to be renewed in our conviction of these things. Be brought back to a better understanding of the things that we believe. So this morning I leave you with the words of John. In 1 John 2 and verse 21, he says, I have not written unto you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And that no lie is of the truth. I speak unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. And that no lie is of the truth. John said, these are things I'm speaking to you because you already know these things. But these are things that you need to be reminded of. You need to know the truth. You need to accept the truth, be convicted of the truth, and know why you believe it. This morning it may be that there is someone here today who is a child of God. You examine your life and you realize that you've not been living it the way that you should. You've allowed yourself to be carried away by sin. If that's the place that you find yourself in today, then we would encourage you to come back, be restored to the faith. Or maybe there's someone here today who has never obeyed the gospel. And this morning you've been convicted of the fact that you need to be a child of God. Well, this morning, if you have faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, for without faith it's impossible to please God, then we would encourage you to repent of your sins. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then you must be willing to confess that faith. Jesus said, if you confess my name before men, I will confess your name before my Father which is in heaven and be baptized into Christ. Be washed in the waters of baptism. Have your sins washed away and be raised to walk in a glorious newness of life. Be made alive spiritually today. Leave this place in a right relationship with God. This morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come while we stand and sing.